up at a farm, and the farm was about two miles out of Scarletville, and about a mile out of Victory Mills, and uh, I don't know how far from Quaker Springs, but we were kind of in between. This farm was, uh, had originally belonged to my grandfather. It may have gone back further than that, I don't know. I don't, I assume my father and mother inherited the farm when my grandfather died. And in that farm, farmhouse is where I was born. Well, I'm Anne Vindvranken, or Anne de Garmo Vindvranken. And uh, this was known as the DeGarmo Farm. But this is the house in which I was uh, born in. Uh, and I was born in January 23rd in 1933. It was a, quite a shock to the family because they already had three boys and now they had a girl. They didn't really know what to name me. My mother didn't have any names picked out or anything. But at the time, the, probably the mo one of the popular names of the time was Patricia Ann. Well, she didn't go for that, so she went for Ann Patricia. <laughs> it caused a lot of problems as I got in college and things, because I said, you don't have your name right, it should be Patricia Ann. I said, no, it's Ann Patricia. And people always insisted I had to be Patricia Ann, which it wasn't. It was always Ann Patricia. But anyway, uh, I don't remember too much when I was very little. And by the time that I was, I had turned six in January and my father passed away in March. So my mother had the job of bringing up four children. The oldest was going to be 14. He turned 14 in March. And uh, in May, I was just six years old. I don't remember too much about my father. He was, uh, everybody told me he was a very gentle, quiet, nice man. The few memories I do have of him, as I remember before I went to bed every night, he would sit me up on the kitchen counter and let me have graham crackers and milk. And I always ate graham cracker and had a glass of milk and then I went to bed. And his, he used to rock, rock me. He had a, it was a platform rocker, rocker at the time. And I think they call him the Lincoln Rocker. And he would sit there in this chair and rock with me and tell me stories and things. And one of the spots he would sit, we had a, didn't have central heating. We had a stove in the, middle of the, or to one side anyway, in the living room. He would sit in this chair by the living room, in the living room, and he would rock and we would watch out the window for Uncle Bertie, who would, was down in Skyliverville someplace having one great time, I'm sure, <laughs> and watching for him to walk home. Uh, my uncle, my father's brother, Burton lived with us, and we always called him Uncle Bertie. And you might be interested in a little bit about Burton de Garmo. I mean, I was, he was a, a tough, uh, rough kind of, rough kind of a guy, but he always was, you know, neat, and he would dress up, and I remember he always wore a gray suit had a gray hat to go with it, and spats, which are the things you put around your feet, you know, and boy, he'd dapper himself right up, and off he would go to Schuylerville. Now, whether he was picking up girls or just having a friendly drink in the 
local pub, I don't know. But it, as I said, he lived, um, he passed away in January of that year, or February, I can't, uh, probably February more like it. And when my father was sick, there were uh, three in the house with pneumonia. My uncle, my father, and my oldest brother, Chauncey. Anyway, <clears throat> all three of them had pneumonia at the same time. And uh, I remember a doctor coming to the house and going upstairs into the house to tend to the, my brother and uncle who were upstairs. <coughs> and uh, then my father, he was so upset after his brother passed away from pneumonia, Chancy got well. And uh, my father, anyway, went out and started doing the chores, which was always Burton's de Garmo job. And uh, he ended up getting what he, they called a relapse of pneumonia. Well, he was a pretty sick man, and he ended up going to the hospital. And they requested or asked my mother if they could use a miracle drug on him. They, it was, they didn't say what it was or anything about it, but they said it was a miracle drug. And they gave him this miracle drug. Later on, and after that, my mother said he turned to the worse. And as I got older and I realized he probably had an allergy to it. It was either sulfur or penicillin. And it was most likely sulfur, <clears throat> but we don't, I don't know. Because I have an allergic, I have allergies to sulfur, and uh, several of our kids have allergies to penicillin. So it was either one or the other that did a bit. The thing I remember at this point was my Aunt Mary Ham, she came to the house and my mother and said, You're, we're going to take you over to see your father. Okay. So she got me all, I had to have a bath and I got all cleaned up and all fancied up and so on and so forth and went to the hospital. And he was in a room where it was dark. I had a cover up with something. I don't know what, it was a gown or something I had put on. And went in this room and saw my father. And that's the last I ever saw of him. The, the funerals at that time were done at home. And I do remember everybody sitting around in the living room the casket was off to the, that we had a bedroom. The, uh, my father's remains, the casket was in another room where people could view, and then they came back in the living room and sat down, and that's where the funeral was. And I, longest time, I couldn't understand why everybody was sitting there crying. Yeah, that was, my first experience of, fun of funerals, I think. Well, I probably was there for my uncle's too, but I don't remember his, but I remember my father's. Then it left my mother a widow with four young children. Grammy, I don't know how she survived to bring up the four of us or where her money came from or anything. And later on, Etta Marie Chancy's wife told me that she, they had told her that Grammy had a lot of, um, my mother anyway, had, my father had left insurance policies and things. There was a uh, farmer that lived up 
It was over on the Stafford's Bridge Road. He had a big, there was a guy that had a big farm and his wife had passed away. And he proposed to your grandmother. <coughs> and uh, she refused him because she says, I am not going to be have anybody, or any of my kids have a stepfather or mother, and all they want sometimes are the kids for their labor. And she had been brought up by a stepmother. She was very young when her uh, mother died, <coughs> and so when her grand, her father remarried. She had a stepmother and a stepsister, and she was not a happy camper, I guess. She always felt she was like the Cinderella of the family. <laughs> but uh, anyway, Grammy kept the farm, was able to keep it, and one of the things she did, I remember, all her farm work was done on what they called shares. And what she would do was, there was one farmer, he would do all the haying and all the cutting in the corn or planting of whatever had to be planted and things. <coughs> and uh, he would take half of it and leave the other half for her, for her. And we had maybe four, three or four cows. We didn't have many cows. We had a lot of young stock and things, but we never had a lot of them, we didn't have, if we had six, the milking cows had been enough. And we were very self-sufficient. Uh, we <coughs> had gardens. We started right out in the springtime picking dandelion greens and started eating dandelion greens. And to this day, I still don't like the bitterness of them. Uh, <coughs> and, uh, then we had asparagus, we had an asparagus bed. We had, <coughs> uh, then we'd plant peas and we'd can them or f Grammy did a lot of canning. If we had uh, had to slaughter our animals, if I, we had pigs, we had chickens. We had a lot of chickens, we had ducks. Uh, we, one time I had a, I don't know how old I was at the time, but we had a little lamb, and that, <laughs> I, I remember somebody, it, the mother disowned it, so the people right near us, one of the farmers around us, gave us this lamb, but I had to, I remember feeding it with a bottle. We kept it in the kitchen for a while, because it was so little, and this little lamb grew up, it would follow me around just like a dog would follow somebody. And that was my pet lamb. Well, I went to school. I knew the inevitable was going to happen because that's the way it is on a farm. And uh, this little lamb would follow me around. And one day we come, I come home from school and we had lamb chops for supper. So that's, that's life on a farm. Yeah, somebody gave us a pair of goats. Well, the nanny goat, she was, you, they were two white goats. They weren't pygmies either. They were, and the little one was, he was young enough and he'd run through the cow stable underneath the cows. And uh, some cow kicked him one, her one day. So we ate goat meat for a while. <laughs> But the billy goat grew up and, oh, I can't look at goat milk, goat cheese, anything. And, oh, he was, they used to tie him out in the fields and he would reek. He was so stink. Oh, he just stunk. And if the wind was right, <laughs> it would turn, just come right up over the right into the house, everything, and everything I could smell was goat. So whenever I see goat milk or hear goat milk, I almost gag. <laughs> but, oh, but we never went hungry. Um, 
we always, as I said, you were self-sufficient. If you, you knew you were going to have pigs, you, they were going to be butchered, and uh, that was a something we all learned early. Grammy survived another way was, uh, I, I don't know where she got these people or where they came from, but it, I remember it was about 1939, 1940, somewhere in that area, probably 1940, 40 or 39, there was a couple from New York City. They were Italian, um, and they came up, and they stayed part of the summer with us. Well, they stopped coming up, but then there was another family that came up, and I don't know, I have no idea what they paid or anything, but they paid to stay in board at the house for a summer vacation. And uh, this man's name was Alfonso. And he and his wife, he had a married daughter and a single daughter. Well, the married daughter, um, she and her husband would, they were, they'd stay several weeks at the house, and they came several years. And the oldest daughter, they ran a haberdashery or a hat designing business or hat making or something, I don't know. It was dealing with basically designing hats and things down in New York City. And... Uh, they would send Grammy hats. Well, she had she was a pretty stylish woman when she had her hats out of right out of New York City specialties. And uh, I remember how much I enjoyed seeing what the hats were going to be and things. And as I got as a teenager and things, I would wear some of these hats. Uh, when the war came along. <coughs> And we got in the war. Chancey graduated in 1942. And by 1943, he and he, when he got out of high school, he went to work in the GE over in Schenectady. And there was a man that used to pick him up from Middle Falls, and they would ride every day to Schenectady. Well, then he was drafted into the war, and he... He left, I couldn't tell you the exact dates or anything, <clears throat> but I remember him leaving and how upset we all kind of were to lose our our big brother, which meant more <clears throat> responsibility for everybody else at home. And then he was sent to California <clears throat> and where he did his basic training, then came back and it was in artillery, I think, and then they begin to need foot troops over in <coughs> uh, Europe and things. So he was sent then to Colorado, was in Colorado for a while, and uh, he, then, he, then he ended up going to Europe. And uh, he was on the front lines, and so he didn't... He, he went in after the battle, and <coughs> when he was there, he ended up with uh, jaundice or hepatitis and ended taken off the front lines and sent into England before he came home. He was in England when the war ended. Well, when Chancey was away, as I said, my brothers became uh, farmers. I mean, they hayed in the summer. My job was to, I had, we had a horse and I had to drive the horse and rake the hay, learn and put it in windrows for them to, so they could pick it up. And it was not a situation you bailed hay like as they do, did later on. It was a case you shoveled it on with a pitchfork. You took it on it went with a pitchfork. And then it was drawn to the barn. As I said, it, it was a interesting growing up, and I think 
this probably is a new chapter in my whole life. So I'll talk to you again, Mackenzie. <laughs>